This is in fact the final live session of the Let's Talk Clocks conference. It's been a phenomenal 10 days and I would like to thank everybody from the attendees, over 1400 of you who have come in and watched live and recorded sessions, um, through to the program leads and most definitely all of the amazing faculty. And actually it's because of that, it's an absolute delight to conclude today, but with Dr. Charlotte Fries presenting um, on this topic, which is both very popular and also so important and a challenging area of thrombosis. But for now, without any further ado, let me introduce Dr. Charlotte Fries. She is a consultant physician in general internal medicine and obstetric medicine based at the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford. Charlotte also works as a consultant obstetric physician at Queen Charlotte's and Chelsea Hospital in London. She has published numerous book chapters and articles and has written obstetric medicine in the Oxford Specialist Handbooks um, for obstetrics and gynaecology series, which was published by Oxford uh, University Press in July 2020. Dr. Fries was also appointed in 2018 as the co-editor in chief of the International Journal on Obstetric Medicine, the Medicine of Pregnancy. So it is my privilege to introduce her today to talk about management of suspected VTE in pregnancy. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Joe, for the kind introduction um, and the invitation to speak today. Um, So this talk is sponsored by Cardinal Health, but this is the appropriate disclaimer about um, the fact that it's been developed independently of the um, company that are sponsoring this. So today my aim is to do sort of three main things. It's to not dwell, but remind you of the normal investigation of DVT and PE, and then compare that and how it differs in the pregnancy setting. And to talk you through the evidence um, gaps where we don't perhaps have as much evidence and um, relevance for all of this in pregnancy. The third strand is just to add in some useful clinical nuggets that I have acquired over the years from looking after women where this has been a common question. Um, so I hope that irrespective of the level of knowledge that you enter this talk with, that, um, no matter your level of experience, um, you'll come out with things that you might not have known before. So why do we always talk about venous thromboembolism in pregnancy? Well, this is the main chart that you may well be familiar with um, that is often displayed and um, when people talk about why women die in pregnancy. And this is because the UK has been a international leader in this field from the 1950s uh, data was collected about women who died in pregnancy or the postnatal period and initially that was called the confidential inquiry into maternal deaths and more recently has become Embrace UK so mothers and babies reducing risk through audit and confidential inquiry and they look at every woman in the UK who dies in pregnancy or the postnatal period and look at the reasons why and the um, patterns nationally as well as in those individual cases where there are any aspects of the care that perhaps could have been done better um, or differently that might have altered the outcome. Now the dark bars represent indirect deaths so these are women who died of a condition that perhaps was made worse in pregnancy and it was the combined effects but it wasn't purely the pregnancy that caused this. Whereas if you look at the um, hatched bars, these are called direct deaths, and these are women who simply wouldn't have had a problem such as postpartum hemorrhage had they not been pregnant. And over the last 60 plus years, the trend has been dramatically different for these two groups of conditions. So the direct deaths have come down quite significantly with the introduction of guidelines and common practice and working out where the problems lie and why women might die of these pregnancy complications. However, the indirect um, deaths really haven't come down to the same degree. Now that is probably a big combination of things. So for example, women becoming older, more complex, entering pregnancy with more comorbidities they, now than they did 30 years ago. But 
it, it's, it's, um, we will still see, and we are still seeing thrombosis and thromboembolism right up there as one of the causes of death, despite over the last 20 years, excellent introduction of guidelines about VTE prophylaxis. So it is very much still a pertinent topic. Women are still dying from this, and we all need to know about this, irrespective of um, which medical specialty or which area of medicine in which we work, because we will always come across women either pregnant or of childbearing age where this is relevant. So I put this um, tool in, not because you need to pick out the minutiae, because this will be very familiar to any obstetric or midwifery um, uh, members of the audience. Um, but and this is the appendix from the RCOG guidelines about VTE prophylaxis. And I put this in to, as a reminder that life is complicated, particularly looking at the antenatal risk factors. There are a number of things that clearly do contribute to an increase in risk of development of VTE in pregnancy, but also factors at delivery, which are taken into consideration postnatal management. But the reason I put this in is not to spell out what everyone already knows, but simply to prompt that actually, whilst this is very familiar to us working in a maternity setting, as soon as you take that pregnant woman and you put her in a different setting, such as a medical unit, actually the approach is not necessarily the same. And whilst a obstetrician might recognise that a 36 year old in her fourth pregnancy, who's a bit overweight and has come in vomiting, is high risk for VTE and needs to be thought about, um, actually that might not be uh, very apparent when she is seen by a medical doctor on a medical unit where a non-maternity risk stratification tool is used. So it's a reminder that it is relevant, but we have to think perhaps more carefully because things like location and the person delivering the care will influence uh, the, how carefully VTE is considered. So first of all, a reminder of what we do in the non-pregnant setting, and um, this is, I'm sure is a very simplified version of what lots of the audience do every day. So we rely on pretest probability scores, which are pretty robust. We think about the Wells score, and we can use that in conjunction with a D-dimer. So actually that removes a whole number of people who simply come in with symptoms suggestive of a DVT, but really they don't ever progress to needing imaging um, or further use of resources, because actually we are happy with ruling out um, the DVT on the basis of those things alone. And we can investigate them with an ultrasound, obviously, if we find a DVT, we treat it, but if it's negative, we then think about repeating at seven days. Well, what about the same scenario in pregnancy? Well, wouldn't it be nice if there was a good pretest probability score that we could use in pregnancy? But unfortunately, things like the Wells score are not validated and not appropriate to use in this setting. People have tried. So a good 10 years ago now, it was suggested this um, left rule. So it, combining the observations that DVT was common if a commoner in the left leg because of the anatomical compression of the left iliac vein by the left right iliac artery demonstrated in this image, the presence of associated edema and um, the fact it was more common in the first trimester. However, it would be a very brave person not to investigate or further pursue the diagnosis in DVT if, for example, it occurred in the right or wasn't in the first trimester. So whilst these were suggestions, this really isn't a helpful pretest probability tool to use in clinical practice. And the most recent green top guidelines published by the RCOG, and you'll see these boxed throughout my talk, said that actually there's no evidence at present to support the use of pretest probability assessment in the management of an acute VTE. So we've ruled out that as an option really already. So what about D-dimer? Well, again, Pregnancy can lead to an increase in D-dimer. Um, historically, there have been case reports of VTE with negative D-dimers. But again, the RCOG guidelines in 2015 said that D-dimer testing should not be performed or used as part of the diagnostic process for women with this presentation. So what's happened since 2015? Well, you can imagine that this is a really 
important area of obstetric practice. If we could reduce the amount of resources used for unnecessary investigations of pregnant women who ultimately don't have a DVT or PE, then um, it would be really useful. So um, there's been a lot of time, effort and investment into finding out um, more about potential biomarkers and what we can do to rule out the diagnosis without the need for imaging. And a big um, study published in 2018, um, coordinated by the DIPEP research group, looked at the question of biomarkers and in conclusion in red said that they really didn't find any potential biomarkers that had any use in either the negative or positive predictive value in the diagnosis of this um, of VTE. However, about a year later in the New England Journal of Medicine, the Artemis study produced uh, an algorithm with slightly differing results. So they used the combination of two different D-dimer thresholds, so here 1,000 and here 500, in combination with some years criteria, and the years criteria that they used were three, so clinical signs of a DVT, presence of hemoptysis, or PE as the most likely diagnosis. And they concluded that actually P was safely ruled out by the use of this algorithm, including the criteria, as well as a D-dimer, and avoided cross-sectional imaging in a large number of women. However, the story doesn't end there. And the group from DIPEP then applied the algorithm from Artemis to the DIPEP cohort, and in short concluded that this wasn't a robust way of excluding VTE in their cohort of women. So I think it's fair to say that whilst this is really helpful and it, there's clearly promise in this kind of approach, I, we really haven't changed our approach clinically as yet to the use of D-dimer in pregnancy or the postnatal period. So if we take out D-dimer, then what are we left with? Well, we're not left with very much between the clinical assessment of a pregnant woman who might have a DVT and the need to perform imaging. And obviously we would move straight to ultrasound. If it's positive, we would treat it. But in contrast to the non-pregnant population, we have options at this point. And again, from the RCOG 2015 guidelines, this relies on your clinical judgment and suspicion. Actually, do we think this is so low risk we don't need to worry and we can just reassure the woman without any further investigation? Do we treat her in a similar way to that in the non-pregnant setting where we then stop the treat empirical anticoagulation and repeat the ultrasound, in which case days three and seven are mentioned in the pregnancy setting? Or do we worry so much about a proximal DVT, so more common in pregnancy, and, um, and consider MRI of her abdomen to make sure that we don't miss that diagnosis. But again, you can see the contrast with the non-pregnant setting where here it relies very much more on the clinician assessment rather than a little bit more of perhaps a binary tool of pretest probability and absolute cutoffs when using biomarkers. So if we then move from DVT to PE, well, what's going to help us? Well, the first question is, what are we looking for in these women? Do these women present differently? Well, unsurprisingly, quite a lot of the symptoms are the same. Pregnancy is not the cause of a cause of pleuritic chest pain. So we would obviously worry about that. However, pregnancy is very good at causing breathlessness and palpitations, and that is a normal finding without any underlying pathological cause in an awful lot of women. Probably over 70% of women uh, after about 30 weeks of pregnancy experience breathlessness. Then if we look at them clinically, can we help? What, what, what are the differences here? Well, you'll be reassured to know that oxygen saturations and respiratory rate are unchanged by pregnancy. So if they are abnormal, then you need to take that seriously. However, there are pregnancy related changes in pulse and blood pressure that I will talk briefly about now, which muddy the water slightly about when to look for PE and when to reassure. If we do an ECG of a pregnant woman, then a sinus tachycardia is common. Um, but if we look at the pattern of the complexes, then actually you can see physiological changes on an ECG related to pregnancy, which include the presence of small non-pathological Q waves in lead three, uh, inferiorly, and um, T wave inversion. But obviously, if you're hunting for a pattern, the traditional S1, Q3, T3, you might then um, over, uh, you might overdiagnose that in the setting of a pregnant woman. <laughs> 
So a couple of slides on sinus tachycardia, because I think there's been some very helpful publications recently, but I, I feel that it's added to the complexity of this area. So quite rightly, the MRACE report in 2019 commented specifically about sinus tachycardia and said a persistent sinus tachy should be a red flag and always be investigated, particularly in the setting of symptoms like breathlessness. And that is because sometimes it was just assumed it was related to pregnancy and it wasn't paid attention to, particularly in women who were inpatients. This is reinforced by relatively recent guidelines using sinus tachycardia as a red flag in women with various medical symptoms. And this is um, just two tables taken from the excellent acute care toolkit about pregnant women um, published by the Royal College of Physicians at the end of 2019. The key thing here, however, is how do you define a tachycardia? Well, that's where it gets a bit more difficult. So historically, we thought that we could potentially have a line in the sand. Um, people came up with a cutoff of, I think it was 105 in pregnancy, um, a, little, a few beats more if they were overweight. But actually, very recent um, publication looking at a large, num a large number of pr normal pregnant women to identify gestational specific vital signs has led to the conclusion that really life is not as straightforward as that and there isn't a single cutoff that you can use. And the two things to look at here are the heart rate that we'll talk about in a minute in more detail and the blood pressure. And the key thing about blood pressure is that I think classically there was a belief that blood pressure dipped in the middle of pregnancy and came up again. And this data refutes that. Yes, it is a little bit lower at the beginning of pregnancy than at the end, but there isn't a dip. And if you see an unwell pregnant woman or woman with a lower blood pressure than she has had before, then actually it's probably not pregnancy alone that's done that. The reason I mentioned the data about tachycardia in a bit more detail is this Found here looking at the 90th and 97th centile of the readings that they got. And from 18 weeks of gestation, heart rates over 100 were certainly, and over 105 after 28 weeks, occurred in more than 10% of observations taken in healthy pregnancy. So whilst we need to be cautious and take notice of the women with the sinus tachycardia, where you draw the line is very difficult, and that how much to worry about that pulse rate and when to worry about it really depends on the individual in front of you and the symptoms that they present with. So if we then talk about what we're going to do, well, we've taken away any pretest the usefulness so far of a pretest probability score or the use of a D-dimer. And that means that we need to think about imaging. And the, it is commonly suggested that pregnant women with a PE have compression ultrasound of their legs, even in the absence of symptoms, because actually if we found a VT at that point, we would treat them and make a clinical diagnosis of a PE, which isn't an unreasonable approach, but actually, clinically is more difficult. This feels often like the chances of the ultrasound being positive are very low in the absence of symptoms. And therefore introducing a potentially unnecessary delay into confirmatory imaging that we'll come to shortly for that pregnant woman who needs a diagnosis made. I mentioned chest x-rays here because I think sometimes we skip over this because we're so concentrating on the issue of a PE and the need to exclude it or identify it with cross-sectional imaging that sometimes a chest x-ray is a slight sideline. And essentially a chest x-ray should always be performed in pregnancy if indicated. We will talk a little bit about radiation coming up to set this scene, but if you would perform this in a non-pregnant woman with this presentation, which you invariably would, then it should be done in pregnancy also. And that can be helpful. So it can identify the diagnosis of something like pulmonary edema. You know, if you find a positive diagnosis that fits with your patient's symptoms and you can treat it, you don't have to continue down the investigation line for PE. I'm now going to have a couple of slides just talking about radiation. So hopefully to help set the scene for the use of procedures involving ionizing radiation in pregnancy, but also helping you if you're meeting these women in the future. And this is a relatively basic diagram, but to give you an idea of a couple of key principles. And I am no nuclear physicist, so please, I apologize for the simplification of this, but this is a helpful way of thinking it through. So. Lots of things around us emit radiation. 
And generally that um, biological risk of the exposure can be measured in sieverts or millisieverts. And if, for example, you will get cosmic radiation from just taking an aeroplane flight. There's um, background radiation all around us, depending on the rocks, um, or, or, you know, local to your particular country. But that is different to the biological absorbed dose that tissues receive, for example, when you have a certain procedure. And you will see the commonly used measurements of this are milligray or gray. Now, there is some interchange in that. You will sometimes see it expressed as sieverts, but to keep it kind of simple, that's the division I've used here. And I encourage you to consider it that way because it keeps it easy. A really good example of this is then a CT of someone's chest. So a CT will produce a fixed amount of radiation for that certain procedure measured in millisieverts. But the biological absorbed dose to different parts of the body will be different. So the absorbed dose to the chest within the direct range of the radi um, radiation procedure will be different to the biological absorbed dose of a fetus, uh, still obviously near the beam of the radiation, but not um, in direct range. So the biological absorbed dose is different depending on part of the body and type of scan. This is just to give you an idea of how it varies around the world. And I'm not really sure how you come up with the average background exposure in pregnancy, or indeed how that has a direct clinical relevance. But this just gives you some idea of the big geographical variation that we accept, because that is the nature of living in different parts of the world. So then let's talk about when we worry in pregnancy. Now, I'm not expecting anyone to ever remember these numbers, but I put this table in to give you an idea of the estimated threshold in the milligray units that I talked about of when we might be concerned in pregnancy. And the key thing here is that it's about a threshold of 200 from significant weeks of pregnancy onwards, because we're that very early gestation, which is a sort of all or nothing effect miscarriage or continuation of pregnancy, is, a, is an estimated threshold, but often earlier than, you know, somebody even knows they're pregnant potentially. And the reason I put these numbers in is to compare and contrast them to the fetal dose in milligray from the common tests we do. And so you'll see that our tests that we commonly do up here are orders of magnitude lower in radiation dose compared to the uh, levels at which there can be significant fetal problems. And I put this to set the scene more than to really advocate ever doing it, but you can see how you get closer to the pelvis, the overall fetal dose increases. There remains a caveat with this in that please don't take these numbers as absolute. Obviously these numbers vary according to scanner, used in your hospital, the exact protocol used. So these are ballpark figures rather than completely absolute that I would quote verbatim. So then let's talk about PE. So what are we going to do with our woman who may well have a PE sitting in front of us? We have two options. So you can see that we can be pretty reassuring about the radiation dose to the fetus from a ventilation perfusion scan. It is possible to reduce the radiation dose of this type of scan further by using a normal chest x-ray as a surrogate for normal ventilation. So you'll find many centres don't even perform the ventilation part, so avoid the inhalation of the radionucleotide altogether because they are happy that the chest x-ray is normal. Now again, um, I can't tell you the intricacies of half dose versus full dose and why we might use this differently in pregnancy to outside, but certainly using half dose of the radioactive isotope for the perfusion component of this scan has not been found to be inferior to use of a full dose and therefore can be used in pregnancy to reduce that fetal exposure even further by performing that. Now, VQ scans are limited, but nuclear medicine scans, this is not a 24-7 scan that you can access. But the other practical aspect that I hadn't really encountered until I started to work in this field is the advice about breastfeeding. Now, the radionucleotide dose is low, but you do excrete the radioisotope in bodily fluids. And that is relevant both for the warnings that you get as medical staff or nursing staff after someone has a nuclear medicine scan like this, which is if you have pregnant staff members, they should avoid looking after women after this scan. But also um, from the point of view of if a woman is breastfeeding, the advice is to express and discard 12 hours following the scan. 
Now that sounds very easy and straightforward advice in theory, but in practice, when a woman with a relatively young baby has come in at short notice as an emergency because of acute symptoms, this is no small undertaking. And so whilst it might sound relatively straightforward, actually practically it is quite an obstruction um, to having a Q scan in a timely manner in this sort of setting, because that woman may never have expressed any breast milk before. She may not have a breast pump. She may not have any other alternative way of feeding her baby. Um, she may not have a supply of formula and sterilized bottles or whatever she needs. And so actually, if this is something to pursue, it is worth making sure that you ask more detailed questions. And if that is our advice, making sure that we support her <coughs> with appropriate input from feeding teams, midwives, midwifery colleagues, um, those sort of people to really help support her and be able to do this. It gets even more complex when you talk about the first three or so days after delivery, um, when the breasts don't produce milk, but they produce colostrum. And in 2019, the Administration of Radioactive Substances Committee produced some advice and said, well, actually, we don't know about the 12 hour cutoff. Um, when colostrum is produced. So in that period, feeding should be interrupted until you can measure the radioactivity of those samples to prove that it is safe to restart. And that's a really difficult one because that is going to be even harder in a practical setting in an emergency unit with a woman who's potentially unwell. And so whilst these are all kind of, they sound initially when you read them as practically quite straightforward, actually in a clinical setting, both of these things are much more difficult for the women than might automatically be anticipated. So what about a CTPA? Well, the radiation dose is probably just as low as the Q scan that we've talked about, a half dose Q scan, for example. But historically, there's been concern for exactly the reason I uh, described um, about the higher dose of radiation to the maternal breast tissue. Obviously, that's in direct, um, you know, in direct beam of radiation having a CTPA. And the reason for that is twofold. Um, first of all, it is thought that the breast tissue of a pregnant or lactating woman is more sensitive to uh, radiation damage because it is hyperplastic. Um, but also the radiation dose is quite significant and numbers previously quoted were 10 to 60 milligray per breast. And that was thought to be associated with a increased lifetime risk of breast cancer to the mother. Reassuringly, more recently, the European Society of Cardiology Guidelines for Acute PE, published in 2019, include this paragraph, which is very helpful to us. And they can be relatively reassuring and say that actually our modern scanners, and modern techniques for image acquisition at the time of CTPA, can actually means that the dose to maternal breast tissue is significantly lower than was previously thought. And therefore the effect on that overall cancer risk is likely to be negligible. And that has been very helpful to us because then it is more difficult um, and indeed inappropriate to justify a significant delay in imaging of pregnant women to enable us to wait for a nuclear medicine scan during working hours. So I think this is helpful to us and certainly came at a good time with the pandemic because obviously a lot more women were having CTPAs in the setting of COVID because of the, con the concern about thrombosis at that time. The issue with CTPA is that the image acquisition timing is classically based on that of a non-pregnant cardiac output. So timed from the dose of contrast into the antecubital fossa and very precisely timed to enable the, um, the, to the pulmonary arteries to be appropriately opacified. Cardiac output in pregnancy increases by about 40% early on. And so that has meant that those calculations have uh, not being quite applicable in pregnancy, and you get that report which says suboptimal opacification of the pulmonary trunk, no big PEs, but small PEs can't be excluded, which can mean you then have to perform a Q scan as well. But there is no real way of circumventing that at the moment. So which one do you therefore go for? Well, I think the key thing is that you have two options and the patient in front of you um, and the, their overall clinical condition and the time of day that you're seeing them, that sort of thing, all add in to which scan is appropriate. 
but I don't think we can add in a significant delay and say that actually a half dose Q-scan is ideal for all women because there will be settings where that's not appropriate. But I hope that this gives you an up-to-date way of counselling your women so that they, um, if they do need a CTPA, it isn't felt that it is the much more dangerous or problematic option. So moving a bit away from investigation, question now is treatment. Well, that's pretty straightforward actually in pregnancy if they are stable and otherwise well. And we use low molecular weight heparin, this does not cross the placenta, but you do need a bit more of it. So please make sure that you have um, pregnancy specific dosing used if they are pregnant, because you the pregnant kidney excretes the low molecular weight heparin just a bit more quickly. In the postnatal period, we use low molecular weight heparin after delivery at the non-pregnant dosing. And then if they are breastfeeding, they do have the option of going onto warfarin, which is fine in that setting. But we do avoid DOACs if they are breastfeeding. People want to monitor and work out whether these women are on the right dose and anti-10A levels are quite commonly um, advised. However, this again is RCOG advice, which says they don't have to be done routinely, but please think about them. If there is a risk of significant under or over dosing of that um, low molecular weight heparin, or if there's a setting such as recurrent VT where we really need to be as clear as we can that they're on the right dose. And a caveat here, please bear in mind that different low molecular weight heparins have different anti-10A um, activity, um, and therefore the anti-10A level does vary a little bit between those types of heparins, as it does with once daily or twice daily dosing. So there isn't a one size fits all range that I would give you that works for all of those medications. So what do we then do? We've got a well woman in front of us, she's got a pee and we've treated her. Well, again, we have a real lack of data and evidence to guide us in who is safe to um, go straight home and who should stay in. And the, the question that I posed to you that I'm not going to be able to answer is, well, is it just enough to say that there are no markers of submassive or massive PE, so their troponin BNP is normal? Is that the same as saying that they're absolutely fine to go home immediately? And I don't have an answer to that, but again, I think it has to be individualized with the woman in front of you. If we then talk about massive PE, again, we know the di diagnosis, we know when to worry about um, these individuals, whether they're pregnant or not. Um, but then the question is, well, what are we going to do with them? And again, your imaging completely depends on how appropriate it is to move them. It may not be appropriate if they're very unstable to take them for a CTPA, in which case you would have to combine your clinical suspicion with something like echocardiography at the bedside. You, we will talk about thrombolysis, but in short, that shouldn't be withheld if it would be indicated if they were not pregnant. But you may well find unfractionated heparin is required before a decision about this. I've just put it in here because there wasn't a good place to mention it elsewhere. Is in the third trimester, you get a phenomenon called apparent heparin resistance, where the factor eight goes up and that impacts your APTT and the APTT is uh, shortened. And what you see in the use of unfractionated heparin in the third trimester is you may see a normal APTT despite increasing doses of an unfractionated heparin infusion. And the key thing here is that they might actually be well anticoagulated, but you may not know it because of the effects of the factor eight levels on the APTT. So in that setting, an anti-10A can be very helpful um, because actually that is a reliable guide of unfractionated heparin in pregnancy or outside. So it's worth thinking about and remembering this phenomenon if you are ever using unfractionated heparin late in pregnancy. In short, Thrombolysis can and should be used in pregnancy if you have someone with a life-threatening massive PE. Um, in a small stud, there are always going to be reports about thrombolysis in pregnancy, and if indicated, it really shouldn't be withheld. There was always a question about whether you could do half dose thrombolysis, whether that is uh, non-inferior or other options. But actually, if you've got someone sick in front of you and ultimately their baby will not survive if they do not survive, then thrombolysis is absolutely an option to you. But again, this is individualized for the woman in front of you and ideally discussed with an expert MDT.
So what about that grey area in non-pregnant people as well as pregnancy? What about the submassive PE? Well, again, the same evidence and restriction of evidence applies. Systemic thrombolysis is not supported in this setting universally. Um, and again, catheter-directed thrombolysis, whilst an attractive emerging option performed in more centres, uh, a variable uh, level in various centres, um, whilst is an option, um, pregnancy shouldn't necessarily be the reason why you change your normal practice. So, um, and again, I don't believe that that's entered any guidance about the management of VT in pregnancy yet, but I think it's something we'll see in the next few years, as we will do in non-pregnant individuals also. So treatment then is pretty straightforward. So we treat for the whole of pregnancy and until six weeks afterwards. However, the only exception to that is if they have an acute VTE towards the end of pregnancy, whereas at, where actually if we stopped at six weeks postnatally, that would be pretty early. So in that setting, we would make sure they carried on for at least three months after that event. So again, compression stockings, similar suggestions to the non-pregnant setting. So they might help with symptoms. And again, the RCOG guidance is put there. However, do remember that particularly in the third trimester, when a woman can barely bend over to reach her socks, asking them to put on compression stockings can actually be much more challenging than, um, than it sounds. And so in whilst it is it should be encouraged um, as suggested by guidelines. Actually, I think we have to be sensible in our approach to this and we shouldn't be implying that it's mandated to them. An IVC filter is often considered, particularly in people who have a late pregnancy VTE and delivery is imminent. And whilst again, the RCOG guidance is quoted here and says consideration should be given to it, um, in most practices, you'll find that that can be avoided and you'll find that um, people who are involved regularly in the care of these women have encountered really quite a number of complications when these IVC filters have been used. So the general approach is to, yes, you can consider it, but you'll probably manage to avoid it in most settings. So then we get onto the slightly more interesting but challenging bit about pregnancy is what on earth do you do at delivery? Well, in women may, uh, established on therapeutic dose anticoagulation, you can, the limitations are mostly anaesthetic in that they can, can't have a regional technique for pain relief uh, if they are within 24 hours of a dose of therapeutic heparin. But if they're over that, it can be used as normal. And with that in mind, it's often attractive to plan induction of labor or at least offer it to them um, to think about those practicalities. Um, it's a reminder here that someone on treatment dose heparin does not have to have a cesarean section. We would not view it as an indication for a cesarean section, even though perhaps that sounds like you could time things a bit more carefully, that's, that's not required. Um, but we would be very careful about the timing of therapeutic heparin to ensure that 24 hour plus window so that their labor could be managed potentially as normal. The most interesting bit from my perspective is the 48 hours after delivery where you have an absolute perfect storm of the maximal prothrombotic changes of the pregnancy immediately following delivery at the same time as the risk of bleeding being highest following delivery, irrespective of mode of delivery. And if we look first at non-pregnant guidelines, I'm sure you'll come across uh, situations where people, uh, their anticoagulation is stopped if a procedure is deemed a high risk of bleeding, and that whilst they might have a prophylactic dose of heparin for 48 hours after that procedure, they would not restart the treatment dose until after that window has passed. And pregnancy guidelines that exist tell us a bit about when not to give heparin, but perhaps a little bit less about when to give it. And one of the points about giving it and not giving it is within timing of spinal anaesthetic or epidural removal, as is quoted here. We also have a bit of guidance about timings after an elective caesarean section. So it is reasonable to give prophylactic dose four hours after a procedure and think about therapeutic heparin a little bit later. But again, that's quite close to that elective section timing. And there's also a suggestion that wound drain should be considered in the setting of a caesarean section. Now, I'm very much a physician and not an obstetrician, but my understanding from um, obstetric conversations in the past has been that whilst this is, can be considered, 
sometimes it can be falsely reassuring and a woman can still be bleeding, but it might not be obvious from the drain. So uh, it is not appropriate or mandated in all women having a cesarean section if they're on anticoagulation that they have to have a drain put in. So much more recently, the um, a big committee came up with the nice intrapartum guidance for the care of women with medical issues. And most of this paragraph is not relevant, uh, is less relevant to the topic here because it is about women who are even higher risk of clot at the time of delivery, which are those women with mechanical heart valves. And the key thing here is that we know that the earlier we introduce therapeutic anticoagulation, the risk of uterine hemorrhage is increased. But uh, the ESC guidance and these NICE guidelines suggest in a small group of women you will see treatment dose given pretty early after delivery. But that's not necessarily required or the right thing in women with VTE. So what's common practice? Well, this is in no guidelines, but it's what I have observed and certainly feel is a reflection of practice around the UK. And on day zero, so the day of delivery, it is if there are no hemostatic concerns, it seems very reasonable to give prophylactic heparin four to six hours after delivery. The next bit that's basically agreed is the day two, which is giving a treatment dose based on their postnatal weight. So remembering their physiology is returning to that of a non-pregnant woman. And that can either be once daily or a split dose, depending on the choice of heparin and the appropriateness in that patient. What varies is what happens after 24 hours. And again, in some women with mechanical valves, you'll see them on treatment dose heparin at this point, either 12 to 24 hours after that initial dose of prophylactic heparin. But in other women, they'll either be on prophylactic dose or intermediate. And this is where the variation comes and has to be individualized again. So this is my final slide. And I think the key thing I want to show is that whilst I've told you about the technicalities of imaging in pregnancy and all the drawbacks that we have compared to the non-pregnant setting, my key point that I'd like you to remember is that it all depends on that initial assessment of your pregnant woman. So that history and examination and working out whether PE is actually on there is the most important part of the assessment of this woman, because that's what determines whether she enters this investigation pathway or not. And we have to be very careful with not just picking one symptom, which probably isn't a PE, um, and saying, well, we can't exclude it, therefore we must carry on and investigate because I think that that contributes to our over-investigation of women. Now, I think that we're never going to have the clinical tools that replace um, the rule out usage of pretest probability or D-dimer, but that seems to me to be the key area to concentrate on. Is it really a considered diagnosis in this woman? And is it therefore really appropriate to carry on down this diagnostic route? Because you are committing them to a number of tests if that is the route we're going. So I'm going to stop there, but I'm very happy. I can see there are questions in the chat and I'm very happy to take whatever questions um, uh, are, are useful. Thank you very much, Charlotte. That was really interesting and does show the complexities of, of managing and these patients. Um, just going back to the start really and, and the pregnant individual, as well as risk assessment throughout pregnancy and on every opportunity when they have an appointment, do you think um, there is more that could be done in also alerting those individuals to risk factors, to, to reduce those risk factors or to the signs and symptoms to present? Are they slow to present quite often or, um, or do you think quite a lot has been done there already? So from a advice to midwifery colleagues perspective, there are various points in pregnancy where the VT risk has to be assessed. So their VT risk assessment from that scoring system has to be done on that first booking visit. So somewhere there will be a score documented that says, look, what's their age, parity, BMI. So you get some idea of their risk category. Um, and the um, midwifery kind of pathway has then to review that at 28 weeks, but also if any other symptoms develop. Um, and a really good example of that is with COVID. So locally, we um, asked any midwife who was informed about a woman being COVID positive to reassess her VTE score to make sure that we'd taken into consideration the COVID, but also the fact that she might be immobile as a result of COVID, which we would view slightly separately and increase her risk. 
I think whilst we are very keen for pregnant women to know about the signs and symptoms of a DVT, I think it is extremely variable as to the level at which people worry about symptoms. So I've seen every spectrum. I've seen women who've been breathless from the first trimester, but presented because it's still going on at 30 weeks, through to the woman who's become suddenly breathless over a couple of days, but thought that was normal for pregnancy. And I think that that subtlety is really hard to ever be particularly specific about. And ultimately, I think we have to trust women that they are the best judge of their symptoms. And therefore, if they are worried, then we would always be happy to see them. And did the management of pregnant people with COVID change very differently from how you've explained? Um, so I think the only impact that I really noticed from the point of view of PE was that we had a lot of women having CTs rather than Q scans appropriately because they had COVID. And I think that whilst locally to me in a couple you know in hearing about people we did an awful lot of ctpas in covid positive pregnant women and found very few pe's so probably a bit different to that of the first wave where the association with covid was felt to be very strong in non-pregnant individuals with the development of pe um, so I certainly noticed people becoming a bit more relaxed about performing a CTPA um, because actually a Q scan in the setting of an abnormal chest X-ray is not ideal anyway. Um, but a part and, and a lot more women having investigations for PE, but the overall process probably didn't change. And again, in the in this group of women, is the recovery very similar to non-pregnant women, or can that be slower? Um, so that's a really difficult question because I'm not sure I have a good idea of the recovery when people go home irrespective of pregnancy. I think as a hospital clinician, you get them well enough to go home, their oxygen levels are normal, and then you might see them a few weeks later when they're better. So I don't think I would necessarily be able to say accurately whether they recover better or not. Um, I suspect it's probably similar because the overall pathology and um, the kind of process is going to be the same, whether they're pregnant or not. Um, but then I, I feel for them. So women increasingly pregnant and getting worse sleep and more breathless for other reasons may feel their recovery is slower from the PE because of those things rather than the PE itself. And certainly in the charity, when we hear from ladies who have suffered a, uh, a VT either during pregnancy or just after giving birth, um, the psychological impact of afterwards can really be quite impactful um, when they realise the risk they may have been at and the future with their baby as well. Um, I think we certainly hear that side. Oh, absolutely. And I think the real thing about all of this is people, um, you know, I didn't really touch on it in great detail, but, you know, the numbers to a pregnant woman of all of the data I put up about VQ and CTPA actually to a pregnant woman matters much less. They are only worried about the fetal exposure and the numbers about that. And I think the same also applies afterwards in that, you know, that recently delivered woman will be prioritising her baby rather over her symptoms. And there will be a reluctance to come to hospital because it's hard, um, not necessarily because she doesn't want to, but because actually a non-sleeping baby and her not sleeping for three weeks is going to mean that it's not easy to come to hospital to be assessed for her own symptoms. So I think that we have to be recognizing and supportive of that. You mentioned about the DAX, but do you find also um, if the VT is, um, or if the anticoagulation continues after delivery, the compliance once they've left hospital because as you describe it, it, you go from thinking solely about the baby to dealing solely with the baby and you forget yourself don't you so how is that compliance better best managed do you think oh gosh I don't have any I don't have any golden rules about that I think I'd be a terrible patient if I had to do this um and I think it's just as difficult in pregnancy as not um often women are not so phased by the injections after delivery because they've done it for the whole of pregnancy and the end is in sight whereas when you start taking your twice daily injections at four weeks of pregnancy I'm sure there isn't an end in sight at all um we rarely see for, for women who need it until six weeks after delivery it would be unusual for us to change them to warfarin for that five week period because we'd only tend to do that about a week after delivery um so it would be a limited time window where they needed to do that anyway um and i'm sure that with the best intentions women uh, it's difficult to be 100 percent compliant with any medication and i suspect this that you know the odds you make it even more difficult in the postnatal period and I guess just understanding the importance and what it, how it's protecting you, isn't it, is, is 
yeah. does. And I imagine that having a PE in pregnancy or afterwards is pretty frightening. And actually that might well be a, a you know, I, I suspect that's a significant motivator for people taking it. There's so much not known about the optimum treatment in, and management in pregnancy. Where do you think the next steps for research would be or would you want to see it going? Well, I mean, I think the key thing is this dotted line on my diagram. You know, I would love to be able to rationalise the use of resources for the women who really needed it. So when you talk about pickup rates from scans, you know, in general medicine, I'd like to think probably 15 to 20 percent plus pickup rate from the people that I would investigate for PE would actually have one, you know, potentially one in five or more people. Whereas if you look data in pregnancy it's probably more like one in 50 because we just don't have the means to be working out how their pretest probability and saying look actually I clinically feel in my gut they don't have a PE but I've got X of Y or Z tool to help me with that and I don't have that and that is what I find difficult and I think that the DIPEP study in Artemis were you know that's what needs to carry on and those questions about biomarkers because if we could rationalize the use of resources that would be ideal both from a hospital perspective and the individual being able to send those women home a bit more quickly than we do at the moment. Thank you and then finally really for the audience and those um, listening in there, obviously, you mentioned the importance of working in a multidiscipline team. Is there also a network where if people have questions or, or want to learn more and, and can go to a professional network that uh, exists that you can signpost to? From a patient perspective or no, from a, um, a clinical perspective? Oh, so um, that's a really exciting area of obstetric medicine at the moment. So um, there are very few obstetric physicians at the moment in the UK, uh, simply a result of training and the restrictions in medical and obstetric training previously, I think. Um, but the, the field is really expanding and a big project taken on and supported by NHS England in the last few years has been the setting up of regional networks. So um, every hospital, um, irrespective of size will be part of a maternal medicine network which will have a uh, kind of referral centre as their hub and other hospitals will contribute so there'll be a next network of expertise. Now there will be obstetricians in every hospital with an obstetric unit who are familiar with high-risk pregnancy and the nuances of management they, they will be the ones who look after women with a VTE so I wouldn't want to ever imply that you needed to go to different hospital routinely because of this occurring in a pregnancy however for the women who are complex difficult or particularly sick then the, a, a smaller hospital with a high-risk obstetric team but without the obstetric medicine special um, expertise can then liaise with the obstetric medicine centre of that network to provide advice, support, transfer over women if required. Um, so that's a really exciting time, um, but the first port of call is always with the local obstetric team because they will have the right members in that bigger team to help support the clinician in the emergency department or the medical unit. 